so I'm, I'm uh, three research trips into a book about Icelandic museums. Uh, the, the essays are coming out in these little chapbooks. And uh, today you're going to be hearing about the stone collector. And uh, I, I don't normally read the, um, the epigraph, but uh, given the things we've been hearing today, it seems appropriate. Um, from the, the woman herself, uh, Losborg Petra Maria Sveinsdotter. At first, I felt as if I was borrowing the stones, but now I've come to terms with the fact that they will remain here forever. Almost every day of her life, Petra went for a walk. Walks up into the hills, mostly, but also walks along the shore. Maybe walks along the relative flat of the unpaved road hemming the eastern fjords, but mostly walks with a vertical bent, with a slope, walks with split and scrabble and crag. And almost every walk, they say, she found a stone. She didn't keep them, not at first, not for a long time. She left them, nestled in the hills or scattered among the shells and the rocks and the shorebirds, left them more or less alone right until she got married and felt she had a place of her own. Then she began to bring them home. She ringed them around the flagpole and along the house wall. She lined them up on bookshelves. The bookshelves filled and the curio cabinets filled, and Petra bought new bookshelves, and those filled up too. And when the little family could spare no more room inside the little home, the stones filled out again, filled up shelves erected outside and covered over benches spread throughout the garden, stretching back up the hill, a reverse avalanche unspooling in slow motion, rock by rock, as if gravity were calling these stones back up to the peaks like a tide. Imagine collecting anything. Pennies or paper clips or blades of grass. Every gum wrapper, every bus ticket, whatever arbitrary thing as a marker of your days. And imagine collecting one almost every day. And imagine... These tokens never broke or got lost or were thrown away. What a tremendous lot of things. It would be a lot of tally marks, and it's certainly a lot of stones. When I say stone, perhaps I should clarify that I do not mean some plain Jane piece of rock. I mean eye-catching. I mean white whisker-width spines radiating out in clusters like so many cowlicks. I mean a green between celery and mustard, pocked with pinprick bubbles and skimming like a rind over a vein crystal clear at the edges, but clotting in the middle to the color of cream stirred into weak tea. I mean crystals like a jumble of molars, and I mean jasper in oxblood and ochre and clover and sky, sometimes a hunk of one color, but more likely a blend of two or three or five, maybe like ice creams melting together, or perhaps like cards stacked in a deck. The eastern coast is the oldest part of Iceland, a crust of 14 volcanoes, not all of them dead. All of Iceland has geological intrigue, including some 150 varieties of minerals. But the East seems particularly rich in both the frequency and variety with which the raw elements of the earth have been heated and pressed into wonders of color and shape and texture. It renders mint green and rouge red. Matte, flat, and crystal clear, all of it spun in spindles and spires and lumps and swirls and brittles and pastes and bubbles and smears. Jasper is particularly common to the east, but also onyx and opal and agate and amethyst. Fossils, too, though they're rarer. Open Vopnafjordr, they found the remains of a deer that arrived before the Ice Age did apparently from a place we would recognize now as Scotland, possibly crossed over on a land bridge long lost to us now. The fossil deer is the only discovery of its kind. In the beginning, they say, 
Petra was always alone on her walks. As a child, she rambled with other children, but as a woman, she walked alone. She spent hours in the hills instead of the home, and it was noticed. It was not normal for a woman to be alone. People talked. They worried. It's not healthy to take the big rocks, they scolded. Your back, the neighbors fretted. Your legs. The point was not necessarily solitude. At least, she was not always alone. There are stories of Petra out with her husband when he wasn't out on the boats. Stories of the stones they left in the mountainside one day and found buried under avalanche the next. There's the cavernous geode Petra and a friend discovered on the beach when they pulled the, the car over along a cove to find a sheltered place to pee. The people who went out with her say that everyone in the party could step over a spot, and then Petra would come to it and turn over a gem. As Petra had her children, four altogether, she took them along with her. They packed themselves lunches and set out. The children could choose whether or not to go along, and sometimes they did, and sometimes they didn't. And after a while, there were grandchildren following Petra into the hills, and great-grandchildren after that. Once Petra and her namesake granddaughter rolled a stone too big to be lifted, rolled it all the way home. Once Petra and a friend set a fraction of their quarry by the road and went back for the rest, but when they returned to the road, the first cache was gone. Petra reworked some flour sacks from her kitchen into bags for carrying the stones, and perhaps she considered the millstones that ground the flour in the first place, and perhaps she never gave it a thought. Sometimes she kept bags in both hands to balance. Or maybe she wore home a pair of crystals, one on the back and one on the front. She might go to the mountains for six or seven or eight hours at a stretch. She might bring down a 40-kilo stone. Maybe she'd bring a toboggan or make a sleigh to move the weight. Maybe she'd return to the shore with a sweater to wrap the stone she'd found and a sun to help and a wash tub between them to lug it home. Her ethics of stone collecting meant you couldn't damage anything to get at the piece you wanted. Petra might take you out to revisit a stone too big or too fragile or too stuck to take home. But you could go anywhere. Even old paths reinvented themselves. Snow would fall or melt. Vegetation would bloom out or wither back. Things with claws or hooves would scratch or tunnel or kick up the dirt. The earth was certainly not creating new stones in the span of a day, but in that same wink, erosion might reveal things differently than yesterday, a chance matter of water and wind and the persistent weak force pulling everything down. The east is the side of the country with reindeer. The east is home to a lake monster in Lagerfjord and the elf queen in Alfaborg and 3% of all the Icelanders there are. There are fjords and a fog that erases them. There are many stretches of sheep and cliffs. Most of the eastern towns are attached to harbors and are the kind of towns where there's probably a restaurant to feed you should you stop in, but probably not two to pick between. In Stoverfjorder, Petra's town, the cafe also sells groceries arranged in two aisles, each three strides long. In the refrigerator case, you can buy a watermelon. Not because Icelanders prize watermelons, but because importing the preponderance of your produce means apples are as exotic as mangoes, and why not have a star fruit if you can have a pear? It is in Stodverfjordr that I learn you would never buy a fish. True, you have your fishmonger if you live in the capital, where the ships are too big and your time too precious to go stand on the dock and wait for the catch. But fish, substantially more than wool sweaters, are a major industry in Iceland. And just as you would never buy a sweater, you know entirely too many knitters, you would never pay for a fish. I learned this in the country church turned guest house where the red velvet pews now face each other in the breakfast nook 
and where I'm sleeping on a futon next to the pulpit. The church is essentially a little box with a high steeple, white with blue trim. It's a, it sits higher up the hill than any other building in town, which affords it a view down to the harbor and across the fjord. The owner is explaining that if you want fish, you go down to the harbor. Her son works on a fishing boat. He'll set you up. How will I know which boat is his, I ask. Doesn't matter, she says. Because you can ask any boat. Because a boat comes in with its catch, and you wave to the fishermen, and you shout that you want to buy a fish. Who knows if they even hear you? But they see you, and they look around the decks, and they pick a fish, and they throw it into your arms. How much, you might call out, your hands full of scales. But they don't want your money. They wave you off. What, would you toss your kroner to them? Pay for your catch with silver lumpfish and shore crabs and capelins stamped on shining coins? It's small change anyway, and they'll only give you a small fish. A fish longer than any bone in your arm, to be sure, but those are the runts. Stova Fjordor had 380 inhabitants when the fish factory was in full swing. For many years, Petra was one of the workers cleaning and deboning the fish there, her husband one of the fishermen hauling them in. It's a town of 200 these days, struggling to keep a school closure at bay. The residents are enterprising and obliging and hoping someone will move in and have some kids. In the beginning, it felt to Petra like a monopoly. She was born in 1922 and married in 1945, and the following year moved to a house called Sunulid for its situation on a sunny slope. And for the next 20 years, it seemed she had the hills more or less to herself. Her favorite mountains were Stedzin and Orukan, the anvil and misfortune. Though who could deny the charm of Sadular, the valley of the sheep? For 20 years, she ranged between the shore and the slope and the mountains north of town. For 20 years, she worked in the fish factory and raised her children and looked after her mother-in-law. Sunuthid was filled and bordered and ringed with stones. Sunuthid was filled with three children in one tiny room, Petra and her husband in the other, and her mother-in-law alone in the last. For 20 years, Petra emptied her bags on the kitchen table, and her children asked if they were getting rocks for supper. There was one road then, as there is one road now, but the one road then stopped at the south edge of town. Just stopped. Fizzled out and kaput, nowhere left to go that a boat or a horse could not traverse better. It all changed in 1962 when the road was extended and made sturdy enough for motor vehicles to travel south out of town. The road meant Petra began to stir farther afield, beyond the shore and the slope, beyond the anvil and misfortune. But the more profound effect was not of Petra going out, but of travelers coming in. They say foreigners came to collect stones long before the Icelander, Icelanders themselves took an interest. Foreigners came with marked-up maps and pneumatic drills and pressure cylinders and candy to give the kids. Germans, they say, came early and come still. Ferry passengers returned to mainland Europe, pockets full of obsidian, so smooth and so sharp. And I think that leaves us uh, still a little time for a conversation. Thank you. So who wants to talk about rocks being taken away from places? Oh, you, sir. Three questions. <laughs> <laughs> is that chapel available? Yeah, indeed it is. Good. Second question. Uh, that was nonfiction, I think. It was an essay. Uh, all three of them, yeah. So um, is that really her name, Petra, which means stone? Uh, indeed, she was um, born on Christmas Eve, and uh, they went for the, the doctor, but the doctor, as is so often the case, came too late. Um, so she was, uh, the midwife was a neighbor, and she's named after the neighbor, who was also Petra. Thank you. 
which is not an Icelandic name. It's an odd thing to crop up. So, but yes, it, it's too perfect, right? Yeah. And the third question is just how do you feel about rock skiing taking away? This is an interesting question. I was, I was marked in my childhood uh, a first grade trip to the beach, and no one had told me that you couldn't take things away. So I, I found this, this lump of quartz that was just astounding to me. Uh, and my best friend later, when we were at my house, explained to me that you can't take things away. And I was so, I couldn't tell anyone, I was so ashamed. I like slipped it into the trash and like hid it so that no one would know. Uh, so I, I, as, as the essay continues, it's, uh, but there's this mass of rocks uh, that then attract this mass of visitors. Um, and I suppose one is always a little conflicted, right? It's important to know what there is. Uh, but it's important it's there to be known. Have you ever taken a rock back? Um, yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, have you been to Hawaii? No, are you offering? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, if you read that beautiful essay in Hawaii, it would create a scandal because they do not, <coughs> it is very, very bad for you there. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, there's a really interesting essay about that. Is that what you're talking about? Yes. About the, yeah, Petrified Forest, and that people also, there's a sense of being bad luck, and people have mailed back, yeah. you know, yeah. Petrified Wood right. that they've taken, yeah. because right. they're like, I can't handle it anymore, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In, in this uh, in this garden, oh, in the yeah. stone collection, mm -hmm. yeah, but they have a, an annual festival to thank the neighbors and the friends, and they fill it with candles. And I can't believe no one's thought, you know what? <laughs> <laughs> just in case it doesn't happen, I want to just say to all three of you, those were really beautiful in very different ways, incredible writing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Sarah, I wanted to tell you that uh, I have an uncle who was. Uh, family lore is that uh, he ran out after the robbers and was shot down in the street of Emory and that the story was in the family at least and there's a newspaper clipping in my mother's genealogy books um, claiming that it was Bonnie and Clara. Oh, okay. Not sure of the year or details right off the top of my head. You should, you should go to the festival. <laughs> There really are so, I mean, I think that was the most fascinating thing to me is how many relatives there are at the festival. And this sort of, it's like a family reunion of both sides, victims and perpetrators. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. can be so dense, uh, right by these, these big towers of rocks, uh, so that, like, like fence posts, folk know fence. Uh, 
Uh, so that, I, I've never made the Celtic connection before, but that would make a lot of sense. Yeah, and, and of course, uh, the, once you start talking about the rocks, you also sort of have to start talking about the elves, right, and the dwarves. <laughs> right, and, uh, but the, the, the elves sort of work as a proxy for, uh, there, there's a thing that's bigger than you, and you should be respectful of it. Mm -hmm. uh, I was in Iceland and uh, Scotland last fall, and I hadn't realized that there's a very strong relationship historically and culturally between the Iceland and the Orkney Islands mm -hmm. off the north of Scotland, they were both Viking uh, centers. And in fact, uh, Orkney was the major one, and Iceland was considered almost a suburb of the Orkneys at that time. And due to my connection, and a lot of it is stone-based, although of course the older stones in Orkney are the standing stones and the Neolithic. But, um, but there is a strong connection, and one of them is in the culture of the the elves, so some of that was brought diffused back to Scotland mm. from Iceland. But an astonishing thing to learn, and when you travel that landscape, and I travel to the south almost to the east, the landscape is such, especially if there's a little bit of fog, um, that you can understand why it is that in contemporary times in this highly educated culture, that at least 50% of the people by every poll is at least agnostic about the belief in elves. <laughs> Uh, and, it's, and it's all stone-based, but it's stones that are commonly covered with lichens and mosses, so that there's an organicness to them. How about you? Did you give away agnostic on those? Uh, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, the, the landscape suggests it, absolutely. I've got a question for you. Um, it seems that from that essay, your experience in Colorado, being lost for a couple of days, important to you to, to what happens to you in Japan. I was just wondering if you write about that in essay or you plan to yeah, so can I reveal that Priscilla Ibarra is like on my dissertation committee? So I feel like this is my defense in preparation or like pre-defense. Um, but that's a really good question. Um, yes, I think uh, I have notes on that. Um, experience and I've tried to write essays. It, it was extremely pivotal. I mean, I was lost in the woods, like seeing mountains for the first time in my life growing up in Lubbock, and we got lost. So it was pretty pivotal. Um, and I haven't really found my way to write that, but I think it's going to be it's going to be a chapter um, in the book. I feel like it's going to be. I feel like this is maybe the start, and then there's another chapter which you've read, the, the one about the horse meat and the alcohol. My first day in Costa Gay, where I. It's, all, it's another sunrise. And then I, th then I might backtrack about that experience to sort of, I don't know, put the reader in that moment, um, maybe feel what I'm feeling to sort of understand this obsession with mountains, sort of like romanticizing them. I, I see the book as sort of a double conversion experience, or what's the opposite of a conversion? A deconversion? A double <laughs> deconversion experience? So staying like, the same? Yes, yeah, staying <laughs> the same, but, but not. But like <laughs> taking one rock and then another rock. Um, and I feel like this was like the first conversion, ex well, the second conversion experience that was then deconverted when I was in Japan. Does that does that make sense? But yeah, I think that's a really pivotal part. I just haven't haven't found my way into that into that essay yet. But I'm hopefully, you know, in the next year or so, I will. Oh, we're at time. Okay. Well, thank you thank all you very all. much. Yeah, thank you guys.